caverns of the snow-fed burns, the mystery that none may ever tell, while still the heather to the hill returns. mystery that none may ever tell, while still the heather to the hill returns. Who are the keepers of the mystery? What is the secret of Scotch whiskey? Whence comes its particular appeal? Why can't it be made anywhere else in the world? These are questions which have long awaited response. The secret is locked in the heart of Scotland, and even those who make it do not themselves know the full answer. For Scotch whisky is of Scotland. It is Scotland, and its qualities defy the analysts as steadfastly as the Scot himself through history has defied the efforts of others to subjugate him. The real character of Scotch can only be produced in the land of its birth. Perhaps part of the answer, but certainly not all, can be found in the fertile fields whose rich soil supports the crops of barley, which will later find themselves clean and steeped in fresh water and spread out on the malting floors at one of the many distilleries. Only the very best quality can be used and each delivery is carefully checked before it is stored in the barley loft. The process begins when the barley is steeped in water for some 60 hours. Here again, even at this early stage, we find a reason for the distinctive quality of the whiskey which will ultimately appear for the water is the water of the highlands, pure, fresh, and crystal clear, the water which bubbles from the mountain springs. Issuing from the red granite, these burns have pointed out the very sites that the distilleries themselves must occupy. But back inside, the barley has been spread on the molting floor after steeping, that is to say, soaking in water. This process brings about certain changes, the outward sign of which can be seen in the growth of the barley corn. Wearing special boots, the maltmen control the rate of growth by turning the barley with their flat wooden shovels, called shills. There is no hard and fast rule controlling germination. Experience alone, passed down from generation to generation, is the yardstick by which the maltman knows. Then comes the next stage. The green malt will be dried in a kiln. The kiln is a pagoda-like structure so typical of Scottish distilleries, and the fuel used for drying is usually peat. Peat is cut from the peat mosses on the heather-clad moors. Centuries have gone into the formation of these rich deposits, and cutting it is work for strong hands. The peat reek, as it is called, passes through a perforated floor high up in the kiln to dry and permeate the malted barley. After a mellowing period of storage, the malt is ground in a mill, and we next see it passing into the mesh tun with water heated to a temperature of 150 degrees Fahrenheit, looking like real Scotch porridge. Revolving rakes stir the mixture from time to time, and at the end of an hour or so, the infusion, now known as Wurtz, is drawn off for cooling. The solid residue left behind is named draft. It is a valuable kettle food, and over a quarter of the original barley is used in this way. 
Meanwhile, the washbacks, the name given to the vast fermenting vessels, are being cleaned and made ready. As the cooled, amber-colored worts flows into the washbacks, yeast is added and the process of fermentation is underway. The mixture seethes and bubbles of its own accord. So violent is the reaction that rotating arms or switchers have to be set in motion to prevent the mixture overflowing. Now we come to the crux of the whole process. The fermented liquid, no longer wort, but wash, is to be distilled twice in pot stills before the final whiskey is obtained. Below, the very stoking of the fires is a job demanding experience, for temperatures must be strictly controlled. Many distillers believe that in the shape of their stills, resembling giant pots, may reside some of the secret virtue of Scotch whisky. It is certain, however, that at this stage nearly all depends on the experience and inherited skill of the stillman. The sounding note of the bobbin, or striking block, tells the experienced ear that the wash is not rising too high, for it is the vapors, not the liquid, that are wanted, and there must be no risk of boiling over. With the actual distilling underway, the excise officer is an interested party for he represents taxation and the revenue, and the lock and key have become an essential part of the proceedings. The vapor passes to the worm in the cooling tubs outside the building, here shown empty of the cooling water to reveal the coiled piping of the worm. This is the apparatus for condensing the vapors to liquid again, and this liquid in turn is redistilled in the second, the spirit still. The distillate at both stages passes through the spirit safe, which is securely locked. Here the distiller makes his tests without direct contact. Aided partly by simple instruments, which can be adjusted from outside the safe, but far more by the knowledge handed down by his father and grandfather before him, the stillman can tell when the magic moment has arrived, and he finds himself making real whiskey. Here, seen hard at work, is checking and repairing the casks in which the whiskey will lie through many a long year. If scotch is to reach its highest perfection, the new whiskey must be left to mature, and maturing can only take place in wood. A heavy loss of volume occurs during this period, as much as five million gallons in a single year may be lost forever into the atmosphere. The casks are filled in a special building, and here again, the excise officer holds the key to one of the pair of locks that secures the door. Of course, the distillery manager has the key to his lock, and when the door is pushed back, we can enter to see the new whiskey being filled into the casks. Samples are taken from each, and the exact quantity and strength are checked and agreed by both excise officer and distiller. unhurried process, during which the utmost care is taken to ensure that the highest standard of quality is maintained. All through the long stretch of years, while the whiskey rests in the warehouses, every cask is inspected at regular intervals. And so, in the crisp, clear air of a tranquil countryside, the hand of time completes the work of man bringing it to that mellow perfection 
that marks its true quality. From fruitful fields, from ancient streams, primeval moors and patient skill has issued a gentle benediction to offer itself for quiet appraisement. So unhurried we pass on through the years to the day when these same casks will leave their rural homes for the noise and bustle of the city. But first, samples are brought before the blender. I have here samples of different whiskies which I'm going to examine before blending. Many of them will be used, perhaps not all. I'm going to see that each one of them has reached the perfection we look for, with its own particular bouquet, or nose as we call it, after its long years of rest in the warehouses. These are Highland malt whiskies from Speyside and other Highland districts. These are malt whiskies from Isla, the island of that name in the Inner Hebrides. These are malt whiskies from the Lowlands. And these are grain whiskies, rather lighter in body, and made from the still which the old exciseman Aeneas Coffey invented 120 years ago. Whiskies from the various distilleries will now be combined in the quantities decided by the blender. And as the bungs are knocked out and the whiskey gurgles into the troughs which will carry it to the blending vets, is imagination being strained too far if we glimpse something of the bubbling activity of those remote Highland burns that gave it life? The actual bringing together of the whiskies is accomplished in huge vets and afterwards the blend is filled into casks again to marry and consummate harmonious union. In this state they remain for anything up to another year, during which frequent tests are made to assure the blender that his faith and knowledge are justified. Then and only then is the blended whiskey ready for bottling, inspection and packing into the cases in which it will find its way to every part of the world. No attempt at imitation can survive comparison, for nowhere else can be reproduced the indefinable quality which comes only from Scotland, from the hands of those who love well what they do. For these are the true keepers of the mystery, and they would have us respect and use well the fruit of their long labors. Oh, no, no, laddie. That's no way to take a dram. This is something that time and history has given us. By the grace of nature, from the hands of skilled craftsmen. You cannot taste it like that. Time has made it, and only time can make enjoyment perfect. Do you not realize what you do? As Alistair Bennett said, something is here of the inside mystery of the ancient distilling art in which, for reasons which give him more pride than humility, and set him oftener seeking than satisfied, the Scot has been marked out as the custodian of ultimate perfection. 